there is a very real um, disingenuity about this very aggressive and wealthy lobby using and exploiting us as disabled people to make waves of false public sympathy to create the idea that you would be better off dead. That's why we're called not dead yet. That's why we're called not dead yet. Because they keep on telling us. Not only would you be better off dead, but we'd all be better off when you are dead. Well, because you take up money, you take up space, you take up beds, and we have to clean up after you and clean you and do all sorts of silly things that we don't want to do. You don't like it, we don't like it, so hey, it's a win-win, isn't it? You know? Oh, and by the way, if you live in Belgium, do you know what you can do? Because, you know, transplants, uh, organs for transplant are so rare. That, you know, by the time you get all that population who are not fit to donate their organs, you get down to a real scarcity of healthy organs. But you know what we're good at? We're good at keeping our organs really nice for you so that when you give us cardiac euthanasia on the operating table, our organs are really nice and clean and healthy and ready to go. And you whip them out, we take them into the next theater next door where the recipients are waiting. All lined up, one for an eye, one for a heart, one for a kidney. And by the way, you can save those people's lives. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do when you die? What a legacy. You can help all those people. Oh, and you know what? Maybe we'll pay you to do it so that we'll look after your family when you're gone. And what? I'm serious. This has started happening in Belgium. Let me just give you quick three examples. Um, talking about ventilators because they're, they're kind of important in some people's lives. Um, one of my best friends is um, now in the British House of Lords. She's been a disability activist all her life. Uh, she was born with spinal muscular um, atrophy. And her parents were told, take her home and enjoy her. She won't last a year. She's 54 years old. She's the, the oldest survivor in the country with her condition. She's done a huge amount of stuff. But as her condition's progressive, every winter is a challenge and every winter is life threatening and it used to be Every other winter, she might find herself in hospital with pneumonia. Um, now it's getting to be two and three, three times a winter. She was in an intensive care unit. Okay, stress, intensive care unit. And she was in a life threatening situation. And the doctor came to her and said, Well, Jane, if anything happens, in other words, if you go into crisis, you, know, you won't want to be resuscitated, will you? Because you, you really don't want to live life on a ventilator, do you? And she said, but that means I'll die. So he went away, and a more senior consultant came in and said, oh, come on now, Jane, you don't really think that you know, life on a ventilator is really where you, where you want to go. She said, but that means I'll die. Her husband went home got a photograph of her in her PhD gown, came flying back into the hospital ward shouting, this is my wife, this is not who you think she is. You treat her as you would treat anybody else. She spent three nights and days awake in an intensive care unit where not only did she need sleep so badly to help her recovery, she spent three nights and three days awake because she was afraid that if she went to sleep she would never wake up again. Where is the trust? Where is the patient safety? Where is the good clinical governance in that kind of treatment? Simon Fitzmaurice, MND, similar sorts of difficulties. In a Cork hospital, his wife and his mother are visiting him. His three children are at home. The doctor comes along to his bedside and says, Simon, it's time to make the hard decision. His wife and his mother are sitting beside him while the doctor is saying, well, look, you know, you've got to die, don't you? So well, let's just pull the plug now. Let's, let's figure out how we're going to do this. Ireland, is, uh, unfortunately, um, some of the, the, the poverty in Ireland means that we don't have the best healthcare system. The Irish medical system, healthcare system, had a policy that nobody went home on ventilators because it was too expensive. Before this case, anyone. Um, 
The third case I'm going to give you very quickly is the case of David Glass. David Glass is 12 years old in Southampton Hospital. Multiple complex needs, similar situation. He's got pneumonia, so it's life-threatening for him. He's being treated in the hospital. And no DNR, no consultation. The doctors, in his case, decide that he needs, David needs, to die with dignity. In other words, they think that the family keeping him alive are cruel. Think about that. And then they decide to withdraw his treatment. No questions. No, no consultation. Then they decide he's not going fast enough, so they decide to terminally sedate him. So they start up his morphine. Up and up and up it goes. The family, knowing full well their child, go in to the ward, rip the morphine out of him. They blow raspberries in his ears to wake him up. They have a fist fight on the ward to get him out. Three of them went to jail for it, for saving his life. And five years later, six, seven years later, his case went all the way to the European Court of Human Rights and he won. And the judges said, that his right to life, his fundamental right to life, had been violated. This is a human rights issue for us. Okay? But you know what really stuck with me? His mum. His mum was talking to the press, and she said, I, didn't, I couldn't understand that. David's a lovely boy. When he smiles at me, I know he's not looking for sweets. It's because he loves me. He's a happy boy. He's never had a bad thought in his life. And you know what those doctors forgot? They forgot that David was loved, no matter what they thought of his life, no matter what they judged his quality of life to be. Now, there is something really wrong when some doctors, and I don't say all, but some doctors think that they are in a position to judge the quality of someone else's life. And the problem is, the judgment is always one way. That life is not worth living. And then they decide. But who gives them the power? Well, funny enough, every legislation, bit of legislation that's been passed so far, every bit of legislation that is written says it's the doctors who will do it because they're the safeguard. Give me a break. So there's a quadriplegic doctor in Britain who um, did a bit of a study. And he talked to emergency room, or what we call accident and emergency doctors. And one in four of those doctors said that they could imagine, imagine living life as a quadriplegic. Ninety percent of quadriplegics said they were alive, they were happy to be alive. Okay, marry that one up for me. Now hang on a second, you just had an accident, you're on your way with brilliant paramedics saving your life, because that's what they do, and they get you into the hospital emergency room, and you're faced with one of the other three doctors who couldn't imagine living the way you're going to have to live. And in fact, they really don't think you should have to. They'll be nice to you because their medical practice is going to say, hey, I can't do any more, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you death because that's what you really want, that's what I really want, that's what any, any sane person would really want. And let's face it, because of all the suffering you're going to have, it's the only moral choice to make. It's the only right thing to do. And then they tell us that we're cruel for thinking of anything else. Imagine thinking about being cruel because you want to live life as a quadriplegic. Think about this, because somebody comes up to you and says, I'm really frightened. I'm scared of dying. I don't know what the process is going to be like. But you know what? I don't want to get old. I don't want to do this. And you talk to them a little bit. And, you know, let's imagine it's a guy and he says, well, okay, I'm you know, married and I've got kids. And, there's just something broken in me, and I can't do it, I can't go on. Lovely wife, all the rest of it, great career, great prospects. And what do you say? Do you say, yeah, okay, I'll help you? Because if you do, you've just killed Count Leo Tolstoy, and you've wiped out some of the world's greatest literature. But ask yourself this, this is the question I'll leave you with. When John comes up to you, or when I come up to you, or Maybe no one in this room. And I say that. And you go, 
yeah, it's been really tough, and uh, it's been really hard. You've, you've done enough, haven't you? This is what one disabled guy is going on about in Britain at the minute. Look, I've done five years, ten years, or fifteen years of this disability work. I've, 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 put my, I've put my good innings in, so, hey, you know, let me go now. Why is it important? Well, it's important because when you see the disability, when you see the disability before you see the person, when you treat the disabled person as the candidate for elimination, and that's what we are. We have one group of people saying, another group of human beings, you are candidates for elimination. And that's what we have to roll back. 